Hey everyone, it's Franchise Horror Reviews, and I hope everybody's having a great day so far. My cat decided he wanted to be in the video, so you'll be seeing him sleeping here <laughs> the whole video. Um, but today I want to continue my uh, series of creep show videos I had planned, and uh, I want to discuss, in my opinion, the spiritual successor to Creep Show 2 and the unofficial Creep Show 3 that came out in 1990 under Paramount Studios, and it's uh, Tales from the Dark Side the movie. Now, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, is a movie gimmick uh, for the uh, anthology show that came out in the 80s. And a lot of people consider the Tales from the Dark Side TV show to be the spiritual successor to the Creepshow movie from 1982. And then Creepshow 2 came out and then entered this whole golden age of horror anthologies. Because once people caught on that uh, horror anthologies were a thing, and they all came from this love from EC Comics and Tales from the Crypt, HBO was like, hey, we're going to go straight to the source and just adapt the things that people were inspired by. And it kicked off this golden age of horror anthology. And this came out right in the heart of it. And there's a, a, a person I brought up in my Creep Show 2 that I think, uh, video that I think played an important role in this. And his name is um, Richard P. Rubenstein. He was a producer on the original Creep Show and Creep Show 2. And his production company acquired film rights from stories written by Stephen King and uh, that one story by L Lucille Fletcher called The Hitchhiker from Creepshow 2. Now, because of budgetary issues from Creepshow 2, um, they had to cut two stories they had the film rights for. They still had The Cat from Hell and they still had Pinfall, which is a, was an original story intended for Creepshow 2 uh, that Stephen King wrote. So they had these stories lying around. And when Rubenstein got contracted through the same production company to work on the Tales from the Dark Side movie by Paramount, they already had the film rights locked and keyed for these two stories. But Rubenstein chose a strategy that seems kind of smart in retrospect. To have some big names like George Romero and Stephen King attached to this little film franchise, and to kind of get away with making unofficial Creepshow sequels <laughs> under the thumb of, uh, you know, film rights owners that own the rights to the Creepshow movies. He took the he took the the stories and split them up. And he said, this one I'm going to put in the first movie, and the second one I'm going to put in the second movie. The, the one he decided to put in the first movie is The Cat from Hell, which is the second story in this film. And the other one was called Pinfall, was supposed to be in the sequel that never got made, um, which is kind of tragic. <laughs> and I, I kind of want to discuss the unplanned sequel uh, for... Tales from the Dark Side in a video after this, only because I find it so fascinating, right? Um, I haven't read any of the stories involved with that movie. Um, I do know what they were. I think uh, they went back to that, that same idea from Creepshow 2 when they went to Lucille Fletcher to get the rights for The Hitchhiker. Um, they decided to pretty much buy film rights wherever they could for stories to put in these movies to kind of fit in the gaps. They needed four stories, so they went to like uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, I don't know the author, but the, uh, an author I don't know the name of wrote the story called um, "The Woman in the Snow" that inspired Lover's Vow. And um, Michael McDowell, the writer of these um, of this movie, adapted uh, uh, the story from Ar uh, Arthur Conan Doyle called "Lot uh, Two Forty Nine, and the story called "Lover's Vow," <clears throat> which he kind of took from and made it into his own story. And then in the second Tales from the Dark Side movie, they went back to Stephen King because they, they wanted to have some more Stephen King uh, stories in there to kind of help sell the movie. So they bought a story that he put out not too long before this, this original one came out here uh, called Rainy Season, which kind of dealt with some, like, I guess, uh, a town that suffers from drought and there might be some toads involved. I don't know. Uh, I haven't read it, but that's what I inferred the stories about. And... <clears throat> There's a story from Robert Block, the creator of Psycho. And that Psycho remake had come out in 1990. And Psycho was kind of back on the mainstream thought. And Robert Block's work was kind of put out there again. So they went back and took one of his uh, science fiction stories about robots called Almost Human. And bought the film rights for that. And they were going to put that in the sequel. And it never got made. So, Pinfall is pretty much the only story associated with Creepshow that never actually got made in some capacity. 
Um, and years later, it was turned into a comic for Arrow Video's limited release of the Blu-ray. And that's essentially the only way you can get that. I think there was a Kickstarter that a fan had that wanted to make a film adaptation of the story and kind of like retroactively add it to Creepshow 2 in like a fan edit, taking uh, Cat from Hell from this, adding it to there as well. I'm not sure if it's been made yet, but I know that that was a thing. Um, but yeah, I, I want to save Tales from the Dark Side, uh, the unmade sequel, for another video. So this film... <clears throat> The production company knew they just wanted to do a three-story format, kind of similar to Creepshow 2. I think Paramount liked the idea of spending less money only doing three stories and having an interluding story, kind of similar to Creepshow 2 as well, to kind of compete with that franchise. Even though Creepshow 3 never even got off the ground, because I think Romero and King just kind of grew uninterested. Uh, but they ran with uh, two stories, uh, the Con uh, two Lot 249, and Lover's Vow to add with The Cat from Hell. And they essentially made this little uh, three-segment movie uh, that's supposed to fit in with, like I said, the 1980s anthology TV show and kind of act like a spiritual um, movie for Creepshow, making it the unofficial Creepshow 3. And you can tell that with Rubenstein's production company because they, they essentially follow the Creepshow 2 formula to the T except without the comic book love and the atomic age horror love to it. Um, but essentially, uh, the story starts off with this woman. She's driving from the grocery store, driving back to her home. And uh, when she gets there, it's, a, it's revealed that there's a boy chained up in her pantry. And there may or may not be some sinister <laughs> plans with this boy. Uh, and she's implied to be a witch. And she's, uh, you know, well acquainted with the macabre and the occult. And she's given this boy a book called Tales from the Dark Side to read. And the boy is pretty much shitting bullets. <laughs> I mean, he's like afraid for his life. And he's trying to stall this woman because he has a plan to leave. But he needs to distract her long enough so that she doesn't notice this. So he just, he's like, hey, wait, 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 wait. You don't have to get to eating me just yet. It's not time. She had an issue with the oven, so she has to wait anyways for the oven to preheat, and she has to prepare the ingredients. But she's willing to entertain the boy and listen to some of the stories. Uh, so he picks out a story called Lot 249, which kicks off the uh, segment parts of the movie. And uh, essentially, this story is about this vengeful guy. He's a graduate student, and he's extremely pissed off that he wasn't able to get into this program he wanted to get into because of this couple. Uh, uh, the girl is played by Julianne Moore and her boyfriend, I forget who plays him. But uh, at his university, there's this um, mummy there. And there's some type of spell that maybe could be used to regenerate the mummy and make it come back to life. And the, the guy, who's played by Steve Buscemi, by the way, the vengeful uh, graduate student, <clears throat> decides to take it upon himself to... Uh, bring the mummy to life and get revenge and essentially kill that couple who screwed him. And when he does this, the mummy essentially comes to life and does exactly what he wanted. Well, after he thought he got away with it all, the, the girl that he wanted revenge on, Julianne Moore's brother, played by Christian Slater, comes into the story. And he's heard about what happened to his sister and essentially has traced it back to this vengeful guy and pretty much tries to coerce a confession out of him. And he won't really confess to it, but, you know, Christian Slater's like, I, I, I know that you did this, and I want to know where the mummy's at. Like, he just has this conviction that this mummy thing is real. So he ties up uh, Busimi's character and essentially comes across the mummy. And you see this really gross scene where he takes, like, a meat carver and cuts up the mummy in front of him. You see maggots crawling in the mummy's corpse and stuff. And it takes care of the mummy. And now, uh, he gets even further screwed by this guy because now his reputation is going to be tarnished and he's not going to be able to get um, what he wants out of life. So he takes it upon himself to <laughs> essentially resurrect something else to get revenge on this brother. And that may or may not come to fruition. And I'm not going to tell you what he resurrects, but it's a pretty smart uh, thing to choose to resurrect. Um, and I think it fits the story well. And uh, it kind of ends on a, a grim note. And that's essentially Lot 249. This story is mostly about um, 
it's kind of similar, like the beginning stories to Creepshow One and Creepshow Two, having that um, vanity subtext, uh, chasing fame subtext, um, doing things for money subtext. But this is more for like opportunities and career opportunities and uh, being screwed and just wanting revenge and how far are you willing to go for revenge um, and using a mummy to kind of vehicle a story like that. Kind of has uh, that old school throwback from like the late 1800s, early 1900s uh, type of storytelling and uh, it feels vintage. The whole story feels kind of vintage. Uh, mildly dated in some areas, but it's a fine story. Not really offering too, something too deep, uh, but I do like the element of the brother coming into the story. Um, I think it does some really cool things with it um, for what it is. So, yeah. Now, the second story is called The Cat from Hell. And The Cat from Hell uh, is introduced after the boy keeps, you know, trying to keep the woman stalled. She's like, oh, well, the timer's on. Uh, oh, but now I have to uh, prepare the ingredients. So the boy's like, here, I got another story for you. It's called The Cat from Hell. And this story is a real dark one. <laughs> um, this one essentially is about this uh, old gentleman who has been terrified of this black cat around his house. And he's come to the conclusion that this black cat is just pure fucking evil. Going around killing things. And he thinks it's after him and trying to kill him. So he enlists the help of a hitman. Um, and I don't know who plays the hitman. I, I forget his name. But the hitman is briefed on the situation by this old man to handle this black cat. And the hitman's like, you know what? I kill people for a living. I, killing a black cat shouldn't be anything, right? And the old man decides to step out of the house and leave the hitman th uh, through the night to handle this cat. So the hitman, uh, essentially for the rest of the story, is trying to bait the cat and, you know, catch him in something and kill it. And throughout the story, every time he tries to kill the cat, he realizes that this cat might be supernatural. Maybe this old man isn't crazy or anything. Because uh, the old man was rich and paying him money. He kind of scoffed at it. Like, you know, this old kook is paying me a lot of money. I'll just handle it and just take his money and run. But he realizes that the old man was kind of telling the truth. And there comes a point near the climax where this guy essentially uncovers the truth about this cat and what it's been doing. And uh, there's a grisly thing that happens with this cat <laughs> and this man. I just want to put it put it that way. It is terrifying, right? So the next day comes around, and this is where the ending happens, where this old man comes back to his house and wants to see if the hitman took care of the cat. And uh, the old man discovers what happened the night before. And something happens that I don't want to spoil. And that's essentially where the story leaves off. Um... This story doesn't really have a lot of substance to it other than um, playing on the macabre and playing on, on the fears of the unknown, the supernatural. Um, you know, a hitman kind of getting punished uh, or put in a situation where he thinks he has control and doesn't. Uh, it's it's kind of playing on uh, retribution a little bit um, in some areas, uh, but not much substance to it than you know what we've covered beforehand. Kind of similar to The Raft. Not really a story for substance, just more for shock value. Because it's the second story. I think that's where they're going for in these movies from, from Creepshow 2 on out. Is that the middle story is supposed to be shock value, right? And then the last story uh, is called Lover's Vow. And the boy in, that, in, in the house with the witch is getting down to crunch time. And he realizes he only has a little bit left. So he just tries to squeeze out one more story. And this one's called Lover's Vow. Uh, which centers around this man. I think he's like a career artist. I think he's played by, uh, what's his name? James Ramar. But he's not making money. He's not really a successful artist. In fact, he's struggling really bad. And he's kind of turned to alcoholism and drinking. And one night, he's out drinking. And he's, you know, out with his buddy. And they're talking about reminiscing on old times, old past successes. And, uh... <clears throat> something happens to him while he's trying to like take a piss and relieve himself from all the alcohol he's been drinking. And he sees a murder happen in a pretty unorthodox way. Uh, and it's done by the supernatural creature, which is depicted to be a gargoyle. And this gargoyle 
corners the man, smells his fear, and, you know, says, you know what, I'll let you live, but you have to promise me that you will never tell a soul about what you just saw. And if you do that, you can live on and have a happy life and success will come to you. And the man, you know, him being drunk and him, like, kind of stewing on his failures in life, agrees to it, you know, almost for self-preservation, but also maybe there could be some hope in this. So he agrees. And uh, the gargoyle flies away. Um, and pretty imme almost immediately after the gargoyle flies away, he has a chance encounter with this woman. Like a once-in-a-lifetime meeting with this woman. Who essentially brings him uh, sort things that he needs to get uh, to the right connections and become successful. And he falls madly in love with this woman. There's a big whirlwind romance with them. And uh, they fall in love and get married. And there's a time j jump in the story where it's now revealed they have two kids. And he's now being revisited in nightmares by this gargoyle. And it's tearing him up inside. He has never told a soul about it, but he made a promise. And he's deathly afraid to tell anybody, but he, he just... He's slowly emotionally breaking down because of the secret he's keeping. And there comes a point in the story where he essentially can't take it anymore. And uh, he feels like he has to tell his wife about what he saw that night with the gargoyle and um something happens uh maybe involving the gargoyle i'm not going to go any further than that and uh it's kind of a a sombering ending i would say uh, and that's lover's vow this one was very emotional very dark very deep there's a lot to dissect with the story um i think there's themes here of uh you know Failure, addiction, um, getting a new lease on life, and then throwing it all away, um, or living in trauma. I mean, there's so much things you can take from this story, and I've seen many different arguments about what the story's trying to say, um, but yeah, th this one's a, a great one to kind of sit down and sink your teeth into, because in this movie, this one has the most substance to it, <clears throat> and it definitely serves a powerful punch being the final segment story here. And then the movie ends off, right, with the boy in the pantry, and he wants to tell another story, but the, the woman's like, okay, no more stories, it's time, it's time for your fate here. And the boy uh, essentially tricks the woman uh, and escapes, and something happens to the woman, pretty, pretty gruesome, and uh, the the movie ends on on that kind of note. So that, in a nutshell, is Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, right? I think the positives to this film is how far the gore effects went. I didn't bring this up, but the stuff with the gargoyle is gruesome. I mean, that, that kill scene you see with the gargoyle and Lover's Vow is brutal. And especially near the ending, when the gargoyle may or may not come back, what happens is phenomenal body horror some of the best body horror effects i've seen in horror movies it's up there it's fantastic wow <laughs> um cat from hell also excellent body horror uh, that seems to be the kind of the, the theme here in this movie is, is pl trying to play on body horror now that i think about it the body horror of it all and the and cat from hell is disturbing and it's such a creepy story uh it has this dark tone atmosphere to it it feels darker than the rest of the segments uh it kind of feels like a noir film in some ways but it's really well told right and the first one lot 249 has that throwback atmosphere to it that uh that pulp era horror vibe to it as well uh and there's body horror there as well dealing with the mummy when the christian slater is cutting up the mummy and stuff you see maggots in its body and stuff the effects look great, and the stories really pack a punch when talking, of, you know, bringing that to the forefront. Um, I think they are able to capture emotions better than Creepshow 2 in a lot of ways. I think these stories inherently are an improvement of Creepshow 2, and I, I think that this movie is a better movie overall uh, in comparison to it. It's just a really well-made movie, but it does have issues... Um, and I think the issues kind of stem down to, um, 
I don't know how to put it. It just doesn't have charm to it. I mean, it has it has so, a cool little setup. I think some people might like the 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 old Tales from the Dark Side book setup better than a comic homage or Atomic Age horror homage that the first two Creep shows were. But <clears throat> I just I just don't get that same vibe here. It's close, and I can definitely see the kid motif playing in to the Creep Show movies. This. Honestly, if you took this title away and called it Creepshow 3 and just presented it to people like that, I think people would buy it. I mean, it's believable. Uh, in terms of individual stories, I think my favorite one was Lover's Vow. I think I gave that one like a 5 out of 5. It's, it's a perfect story. It's up there with the crate for me. It's a great, well-told one. Cat from Hell? I gave this one a 4.5 out of 5. This was a very effective story. Um... It's kind of played up for shock value like the raft, and it, it does what it's trying to do very well. Uh, very, very eerie one. And then, Lot 249 is probably my least favorite that I've encountered in these reviews so far. Um, it's very mean-spirited, and it's kind of hokey. <laughs> and, you know, the, the first creep show was a schlocky movie. Don't get me wrong. The second movie isn't as schlocky, but it is kind of still weird. This story is just very pulpy and hokey. Um, it kind of played out a little bit. Kind of already know what to expect. And I, I would say you can even make that same argument for Lover's Vow or even Cat from Hell in some regards. They're kind of predictable stories. But this one just isn't that engaging. I'm just, I don't like the characters as much. Um, there's really no moral to it other than it's just like a, a revenge story. Um, and it kind of lacks substance. Uh, you know... Cat from Hell doesn't have substance, but this just, I think it should have had it to make it elevated more. But uh, I give this one about a 3 out of 5 stars. Not terrible, by, by any means, but just kind of weak. <laughs> um, so overall, I think this movie has a, a better average than Creepshow 2. Uh, I do like some elements of Creepshow 2 better than this. But I think overall, in terms of like the stories and stuff, this is better. Um, and I... This is one of my personal favorite horror movies. It's not quite one, an all-timer, but this is one I watch a lot. I've had this DVD for quite some time. Uh, I really want the, the, the steel book of this movie because it's phenomenal. I'd probably give this movie about a 4.5 out of 5. This was truly a great movie for what it was. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts about Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. Let me know down in the comment section. Did you love this? Did you hate this? What was your favorite story? What was your least favorite story? I'm dying to know, and I'll see you next time.